So, can we please give a huge ba 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 cheer, whoop, and welcome to Peter Gray? Right. My first time doing this, so I've got to try and figure out how I can see everything and everybody and get on with this. Right, I'm going to click and we're going to start. And then it starts. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the Amsterdam, uh, which beached at Bulverhive on the 26th of January in 1749. And it's a bit of a sailing mystery, because I wanted to an answer the question of why did she end up in Pansy Bay? Because she was on her way to Jakarta, and there's quite a difference. But there were five other ships that were also heading to Jakarta and they managed to get to Portsmouth and then they, some of them went on to Jakarta. But this one never got any further than here. She sank in the mud. I also want to ask how did she come ashore at Bulbahide? How did she manage it? My interest is in sailing. I'm going to try and keep this fairly simple on the sailing side. So my first encounter with the Amsterdam it was quite a long time ago, on a wet weekend in Amsterdam. And I had this great idea with the family, let's go on a canal and harbour cruise in the rain, because... <laughs> now, we didn't actually go in a boat like that, we went in a boat like this. Lovely boat. So, 80 soaking wet tourists in a heated, glass-topped boat. I'm just going to let that ride for a little bit. Yes, we couldn't see anything out of the windows for most of the journey. And towards the end of the, uh, of the cruise, we ended in, in the harbour part, and the skipper turned into, into a dock, and suddenly said, and on your left is a replica of the Amsterdam, which ran aground in Hastings. And there it was. We were in this little uh, cruise ship, and it was raining, and we came past this enormous ship, and it really is a very big ship. Um, one of the stories about the Amsterdam is that there was this huge storm and the Amsterdam was somehow kind of overtaken by a storm. And I don't think that's quite true because the Amsterdam is a ship designed to sail all the way to Jakarta. She's going to spend, this is her route, the kind of the turquoisey one. She's going to spend about three months in deep in the Atlantic Ocean getting nearer to South America at some point before she picks the westerlies up into Cape Town. So the idea that the Amsterdam was going to get caught out by a bit of a blow in the English Channel seemed a bit rich. And after all, we're the stand-up paddleboard end of the English Channel. The other end of the Channel, they get to go surfing. So, you know, it was not really wind strength or storms that would have bothered the Amsterdam. It would have been wind direction because fundamentally she's a downwind sailor. And I kind of left it there, just, just in my head, that that was the situation with the Amsterdam. Um, I did also, the other key thing that I found out when I went to visit the museum, the actual ship, and I got on board, about lots of sailors had died on this journey, and by the time they got to Pemsey Bay and sunk in the mud, 50 sailors had died, and even more sailors died trying to get them off the boat at the end. So. That was a big clue to what had happened. So here we are. Um, this is a week before lockdown, and I'm down at the Amsterdam <laughs> with my dog, Bruno, here. Hello, Bruno. And uh, I've got this feeling this is a great metaphor for a song, because the Amsterdam is two-thirds complete in the mud under there, and all her cargo is still there. They never got it off, because she sank not super quickly, over many weeks, but she did sink before they could get the cargo off. And I thought, well, that's a great metaphor. It's this mission, you're stuck in the sand, and every low tide you're humiliated by this reminder to the whole world that you've never finished your, your mission. So I kind of started to write a song, got the music together, got a bit of an introduction going, and then I got stuck, because the only thing that came into my head was this shed that I bought off eBay. And it, it's never been built, 
and it never will be built. And there's just bits of it now in the in the allotment that I see every now now and then, because we used it for other things. And I didn't want to write a song about an allotment, so I left the song there, and I'm going to play you that short bit of the song uh, later at the end. Uh, but it did inspire me to contact the Dutch Maritime Museum and see if they had any information for me about the ship, because I'm interested in sailing, any ship's logs or anything like that. Um, and they sent me a list of things I should do. Two things. Read this book, because Peter Marsden did a huge amount of research on this, uh, and so I did. And there's lots of copies of this book in the East Sussex Library Service if anybody wants to uh, um, get a copy. And that's where I found out that there were five other ships as well as just the Amsterdam. It's not just a story about the Amsterdam. And the other thing was the letters of John Collier, who was a bit of a chronicler of uh, activities in Hastings. So if anything happened uh, in that period, he'd know about it. Right. I'm afraid we're going to have to have a cup full of um, a couple of theory. Now, you may have spotted I've got a bit of a northern accent. I'm from Derbyshire, very near where Ellen MacArthur was born. And we share a few things. Uh, we both learned to sail in Derbyshire, landlocked Derbyshire. And we both had Saturday jobs and saved up and bought our first yachts at the age of 17. Um, and she, of course she sailed hers around Britain. And I brought mine with me. You've got to dream, haven't you? So I just want to uh, oh, rig it, which doesn't take too long. There we go. Right. So, just a little bit, just a cup full of of, uh, of uh, theory about sailing boats. So this is a more familiar triangular sailed sailing boat, often called fore and aft, or Bermuda rig. And it has the advantage that it can make some upwind progress. So the green area, if it's the dot in the middle, it can sail about 270 degrees. So if the wind was coming from the back there, this boat could zigzag its way and make its way upwind. But the Amsterdam is a square rig, kind of has its sails in a different position, and it can't make any upwind performance. In fact, it's really a downwind sailor. So in the context of the Amsterdam and any other ship trying to sail west through the English Channel, the wind has got to have some east in it. Otherwise, it won't work. Right. I think we're done with the ship for the moment. Um, but I did want to show you a bit later on. I did manage to get to uh, sail a boat. And I sailed out of Royal Sovereign, uh, the Sovereign Harbour, uh, on my way to Brighton. And you can see me zigzagging against a southwesterly wind. Now, if the Amsterdam was trying to sail, it couldn't do that. The only way it could go would be down here, southeasterly, would be the best it could make, away, away from the wind. I'm just, uh, my cup full, it's, it's, get, it's turning into a bit of a mug, isn't it, my cup full of theory. I just want to show you, there's the triangular sails. This was the boat that I used to sail in, the 1980s little plus fibre boat I had a share in, and I want to show you what's underneath the boat, because it's what's underneath the boat that actually makes these sorts of sailing boats work. And this has got something underneath it. So you've got a keel, and you've got a rudder. And those two things under the boat work together with the sails on top to enable it to do this zigzag and make its way um, sailing upwind. I'm not really going to explain sailing downwind because it's like a paper bag blowing down a street. You don't really need to know how that works. <coughs> upwind is a tricky one. Now, if you take away the, uh, the keel on this boat, it can't sail upwind anymore. It becomes a downwind sailor. But if you take away the rudder, it's completely useless. And I'll just show you another little trip I went on. 
This is sailing round the Isle of Wight, where Tim recently visited and got no inspiration. Uh, so here I was, trying to get down the Isle of Wight, did a nice long tack down, but I wasn't going to make it, so I put another tack in. And as I made the next tack, the rudder fell off. Now, I managed to hold on to it and pull it aboard, but this is what happens when a rudder comes off a boat, sailing boat. That's right. You start to draw a dog. And around about number 87, the RNLI picked us up and towed us back into Lymington because really, you can't do anything. Now, I mention that because the Amsterdam had lost her rudder on her way into Peversby Bay. She'd grounded on a sandbank. So she had no rudder, and I was thinking, oh, that's it, she's finished, didn't she? But then I started looking into sailing these sorts of boats. And if you look underneath a boat like the Amsterdam, it hasn't got anything sticking deep. It hasn't got a very big rudder. And the second most amazing thing I found when I tried to, to, to understand how to sail these boats was when they said, oh, well, these sorts of sailing boats don't use the rudder to steer. I could, well, <laughs> I was doubly shocked. But they have this amazing thing. They've got these two sails. Now, they are a little bit familiar. They're slightly similar to the fore and aft sails. And we've got the fore sail at the front. And you'll never guess what they named the sail at the back of the boat. A spanker. <laughs> so I'm going to pull this down and give you a little demonstration of how that all worked. So here's my foresail at the front of the boat. And if the wind was coming from Dan's piano, maybe, and it caught my front sail, it would push the boat round this way. But if I put my spanker sail up, it'll spank it back round this way. And so they used these sails and balanced them and said, well, which way do we want to go? Oh, we want to go over there, so we need that much sail at the front and we need that much spanker at the back. And that sets it on its course and off it goes. And the rudder is just used as a little trim tab in case it gets a little bit wear, <coughs> wayward. But essentially it's sailing, it's steering with its sails. And that's what it looks like. This isn't the Amsterdam, this is the Gothenburg. The Amsterdam is a fully working sailing boat, and they have sailed it, but they spend all its time in Amsterdam. This one sails all the way around the world, and this one has sailed on the exact route that the Amsterdam would have taken to Jakarta, and sailed all the way back. In fact, she's on a second uh, go at doing it at the moment, and she's overwintering in Barcelona, and she'll be coming past uh, late... March, early April. But you can see the triangular sails at the front and you can see the spanker at the back that's holding the course. So that's how these sailing boats work. And the rest of it is just been blown, blown downwind with the big triangular sails. So, six ships. So before the Amsterdam ended up in Pemsey Bay, she was with the other five ships at a roadstead, which is a new word for me. I've heard of homestead, but a roadstead is a very safe place to anchor. And this is just off Deal now. There we go. There's Deal. It's called the Downs. You can see the three anchors there. This is a map from the 1840s. This is about 100 years later. The depths are in fathoms. So eight and nine fathoms is about 15 metres. Now, I'm going to show you a modern chart. Uh, there's Deal again. And this is the area they were in. Which is, I was really amazed at how skillful these six sailing boats were. Because outside here is what's known as Godwin Sands. And Godwin Sands have claimed about 2,000 ships in their time. To this day, boats, boats are still, who are not paying attention, running aground. And they'd sailed round these and managed to get up there to, to shelter from some storms before they had their final attempt at getting through the English Channel. 
And this is what I estimate to be the, the course that the Amsterdam took. Because she was seen, um, she was seen off, uh, off Rye, Rye Bay here, of course she was seen off Hastings and then she ended up in Pevensey Bay. But the other ship, the other five ships, I think took a route like this. Now, also, I'm showing you here, this pink thing in the middle is the traffic separation scheme that happens way out there. So we only really ever see the westbound ships, if you look out from Eastbourne, you'll sometimes see the line of ships heading westbound. That's about 14 miles offshore. But the eastbound traffic is about 28 miles, so we, never really, we can never really see those. They're too far away. Which is why I don't think anybody saw these other five ships come past. Um, so the letters of John Collier, for example, nobody's, nobody knew about these five ships, but they wouldn't have known about them because they'd have sailed past. And there we have what I es just estimate to be the route that they ended up in Portsmouth. And I put the compass rose in the corner here because we know that if they want to head west, there's got to be some east in it. And we can see that their routes are the opposite from where from west so they are possible and the difference between these two boat uh, the the five boats and the, and the Amsterdam and I think we come back to these six sailors I think the Amsterdam had so many six sailors on they couldn't set the sails properly and so they had to they had to take a, 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 a poorer route whereas the well sailed uh, ships could get the best out of their sailing ships and get and, and, and sail them deeper into the water and they're much safer there deep in the water so the other thing that obviously happened was the Amsterdam got stuck in Pemsey Bay now if the wind had just been easterly I think even the even the Amsterdam would have got past Pemsey, uh, got past Beachy Head uh, but the, the wind turned southerly and that's why she was stuck in there. And it's also why the five ships ended up having to come into Portsmouth early, rather than carry on going down the English Channel. But they had about 50 miles worth of water to, to keep, them, keep them safe. So, the next thing is where were they in Pevensey Bay? And now we come on to Mr. Worge, who wrote to Mr. Collier, who was in Bath. I know some people say Bath, but I have to say Bath. 17th of January, 1748. Anybody notice anything odd about that date? Okay, well, the, the, the Amsterdam ran aground on the 26th of January, and Mr. Collier, Mr. Wurge, is writing on the 17th of January. Also, the Amsterdam ran aground in 1749 and he's writing in 1748. This may come as a surprise to some of you, but Britain was a little bit out of step with the rest of Europe at this time. Um, the, most European countries were using the Gregorian calendar and we were using the Julian calendar. And we were 11 days out, plus we didn't celebrate New Year till Annunciation Day on the 25th of March. So it really was 1749, but we were using those old dates. <coughs> Who'd have thought it? Can you imagine the paperwork at Dover trying to get stuff exported? <laughs> there were massive queues of horse and carts all the way up the M2, mud two, shall I say. Right, what did Mr. Welch have to say? She was a new ship and had been all this time beating about and never got beyond Beachy Head. Well, we know that already. Tell us something new. At anchor off Bex Hill. Brilliant. Now we know where she was. So let's get another chart up. I'll put a little uh, Amsterdam at anchor a couple of miles off because they, they did like to anchor quite a way off. Now these uh, little black things here are rocks. Now we've got a, the Bex Hill reef, it's just a whole great big reef, but these are specific rocks. And this little rock here is called the Bo Peep Rock. You may have heard of Bo Peep, Bo Peep. Um, 
on the railway line into the Bo Peep Junction, the Bo Peep Pub. Anyway, there's the Bo Peep Rock. No idea why they're called Bo Peep, and that's where the Amsterdam is. So we're trying to think about how the Amsterdam uh, came ashore. So what's happening? So the Amsterdam, she's going to try and come ashore on a, on a high tide. Okay. Uh, but when the tide's coming in, the whole of the English Channel at this point is moving in that a direction. A whole sea. You may have noticed that if you go swimming sometimes, you turn around, you come back, and you, can <laughs> move down the, you move down the coast a little bit. And that's because the whole of the body of water, as the tide's coming in, is moving west, uh, eastwards. So that's the most powerful force, and that would have sw swing any boat on its anchor. So she'd be facing the wrong way. The other force you've got is, is the tides coming in, but that's fairly weak. It's not a rip tides of things, something a completely different thing, but this, this is just coming in gently. And we know these ships, we did, the wind would have to be from the south to make it all work. So I was getting, I was getting a thing a bit ahead of myself, I think, oh, I'm, I, cause I couldn't wait to use a spanker sail. And then I kind of, I went a bit black because I realised I don't know how to sail one of these boats. I'll be, I'll be fooling myself. I need to speak to a sea captain. I need to speak to somebody who actually knows about how these things work. And they're not easy to find because they're not exactly on LinkedIn or anything like that. And there's not that many of them around. But I was searching around one day for sailing away from an anchor and this classic sailing website came up. And there was nothing about sailing away from an anchor, it just said the words sailing away from an anchor. But I had a little click around and there was ask us a question. So I thought, hmm. In fact, I'll tell you what I thought about. I thought about Alice's Restaurant. Does anybody know that song? The 27 8 by 10 colour glossy pictures. I had one of those moments. So I did the whole story with all the uh, circles and arrows on the back to tell them all about the tide and the, and the wind and waited and lo and behold i got a response from adam purser who is the joint founder of uh, classic sailing and a sea you know sea captain um and, uh, for these types of boats and a trainer on these types of boats as well and this is what he said i think they did not have much say in the matter if the anchor parted suddenly the bows would have been blown off by the wind, and once the moment of the swing began, she would spin out of control. Setting sails would just have made them approach the beach faster. That they went ashore bow first is therefore likely to have been entirely a result they had no control over. That took the wind out of my sails, I can tell you. I thought, oh no, that doesn't kind of work. How? Because I really wanted the Amsterdam to have come ashore because of the incredible skill of the sailors. And it turned out, if they'd have come ashore in these big storms, they wouldn't have had much control at all. But I kept thinking about it because I thought, well, Captain Clump, because he was, that was his name, Captain Willem Clump, and his senior officers must have known that because they all signed a special document that enabled them to, to um, beach the boat. And when the boat was beached, Captain Clump took that document to Hastings and got the signature of the mayor. And after he got the signature of the mayor, he took it up to London to the Dutch East India officers to get their signature. So that, that kind of didn't quite fix. I thought, well, they, they obviously really thought, <laughs> thought they were going to succeed. And yet, what Adam Purser says, he's absolutely right. It's mad to take a boat in, in a storm. So I got stuck again and had a bit of a think. And then about this time last year, we're talking about the beautiful weather. Can you remember the weather at this time last year? We'd had Dudley, we'd had Eunice, and we were about to have Franklin. Lots of storms. But I know about storms. Storms are not consistent. In stories, it's been blue for the whole of February, a storm. But actually, when you drill down on the statistics, it won't have been the same wind strength all the time. It varies. All sorts of things happen. So I looked up the historical weather, and here we are, Friday the 18th. I was in St. Leonard's. 
I had the power cut in the afternoon and then the mobile phone signal went down and but you can see here's here's the wind the wind was only really strong for a few hours but it wreaked absolute havoc and then just a few days later on Wednesday the winds like this now the next day Thursday it started out fairly mild but by Thursday afternoon it was really strong winds and then we were into another cycle of storms so I just wondered if that could be a, a clue that maybe there was a gap in the weather and it just all worked out right for the Amsterdam so the final slide well nearly the final slide so I thought yes maybe that's how they did it they waited for the wind to be right and the tide to come in and a bit of wind from the south because uh, they left the the downs on the 8th of January and he, and they put the boat ashore on the 26th so that's that's uh, that's quite a few days to figure out what to do I've, I've drawn a rough line of what I think might have happened I think they only just got in because this part of the beach here this part of the beach is completely sandy and all here is rocky so they only just squeaked in past the Bo Peep rocks they only just made it in so and I think Adam Purser was right they would be they would have been rushed they would have gone too fast to the shoreline even at two miles off uh, so I think I think it was skill that got them ashore. They didn't just spin around and just happen to, to, to go bow first in at Bulba Hive, where they are today. And that's it. There is the outline of it. And there's Bruno. If you want to see the Amsterdam, the very lowest tide of the year is coming up on the 23rd of March. It is 6.30 in the morning, but it'll be, down, it'll be out for hours. So if you turn up a bit after, you will see it. Um, and the only other thing to say is I'm now going to put to sing you my little song as far as I got and guarantee nothing about sheds it is quite a short song really That's not the end of the song. <laughs> That's just the bit that I want you to join in on when you hear it at the end of the song. I did get a little bit further. When the moon casts itself against the sun time to go blank. It does happen to people, doesn't it? Alright, we'll start again. <laughs> when the moon casts itself against the sun, tidal forces act as one, as the waters ebb away into the sand. What remains is the Amsterdam. Lies half deep, wide awake asleep. 
surface every now and then just to sink again sink again open rib cage of a house Skeleton without a skull A ghost ship going nowhere in the sand A stranded Amsterdam Here we go Amsterdam 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 Thank you.